Good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome to The Caring View. I am Adam Pennell, currently being attacked by sunlight in my extension. Um, this is The Caring View, the only and number one, not just because we're the only, but we are the number one social care chat show that goes live weekly, every week, exclusive to YouTube. Uh, before we get started, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, click that bell, You'll be alerted to anything that we upload, all of our new episodes, and anything we discuss tonight is of our own views and opinions, not the companies we represent. Tonight, I am joined by my co-host. I can't believe it. It's been like, what, a year, Mark? Uh, how are you doing? How have you been? Oh, it feels like a year, let me tell you. I think last time we did the show, I was, I was looking out the window a minute ago. And I was thinking, I swear last time I did the show, it was like pitch black. I don't remember, you know, it being light in the evening. So, yeah, I feel like I've missed out on some really good conversations that you've had. I've obviously watched them on catch up when I can. But, yeah, it feels like a long time. It feels strange. I mean, you, there have been some really good episodes, but I think I speak for everyone. Are you OK? Everyone's been asking me, Mark. People have been tweeting us. People have been getting at us on LinkedIn. Are you OK? How are you feeling? um yeah no i'm okay i'm not 100 percent. i'd say i feel like i'm at about 50 percent, if that but otherwise yeah i'm plodding along ticking along as i can and last week you weren't with us you were in cyprus you know doing what we would all love to do in jet set away so you know i'm, I'm glad you're on the mend i'm glad you're doing okay um and i'm really glad to have you back i've missed you i've missed you, yeah, um, I've missed you too, and it's good to be back so I'm going to ask you a question now because you've uh, been away not working and skiving and being on holiday. What's new in social care? Is there anything new? Have you heard anything that we need to talk about tonight before we bring our fabulous guest in? No, I, the only thing that I've really seen, and I'll be honest, I haven't been on social media as much as I normally would over the last couple of weeks, but I did see an article today saying that the number of learning disability services that are closing because of admissions and bits and pieces are being impacted because of the pandemic, which is slightly worrying, where you know, people with a learning disability will end up living because obviously these places need specialist staff to support them. So that's a slight concern. Um, and our guest tonight, prior to going live tonight, was just letting me know about the mental health and wellbeing plan um, that the government have launched today. So a survey. So we'll share that in the comments section for everybody. But yeah. No, fantastic. I mean, I've not heard anything since last week's show. Um, a lot of conversation at the moment is around visiting in care homes. Um, all visiting guidance has been withdrawn. Uh, visiting should be back to normal in the majority of cases now in care homes. Um, so like I said last week, if you aren't experiencing that, uh, you are still having restricted visits, you aren't able to go and see your loved ones, please do get in touch. We'd love to speak to you. Um, if anything, we'd love to support you. It doesn't have to be on the show, but Mark and I would like you know to lend our services to help get you those visits in care homes as you need. So tonight we are discussing positive risk taking. Now I know that sounds like a boring topic, but before the pandemic hit, I was a firm believer of positive risk taking. I was a firm believer that um, we could do what we wanted to do um, as long as it was within reason, as long as we were safe whilst doing it. Um, and a lot of the stuff behind John's campaign, behind uh, dementia care, behind a lot of the stuff that Mark did in, in his learning disability environment was all about positive risk-taking. Pandemics come along, changed the, the landscape of care. We've gone back, I would say, a bit with us tonight. Mark Howe Senior um, of How To uh, Care Training to discuss positive risk-taking. So good evening, Mark. How are you? Yeah, I'm very good, thanks. Very good. So... Positive risk taking. Mark, do you want to give us a bit of a background about who you are, what how to training is, um, and 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 how you got to where you are today? <clears throat> yeah, um, I'm a bit old now, but I've been in education and care for just over thirty years. I was actually caring for the elderly as a teenager at college on placement, and I'd wanted to be a teacher. Went to university, secondary school teaching, hated it. Um, didn't follow that through so found myself doing care work it was with adults with learning disability mental health autism it was a service for epilepsy 
um, lots of behaviors thinking it would be a few months experience and i think i was there for over four years um, and in them days it was a lot of the guys that oh they've got this thing called a learning disability let's put me in a home out of the way um heaven forbid we'd want to take someone with epilepsy swimming um heaven forbid we could go away and do holidays at center parks um you know you name it some things could be done but i'm a big believer that we shouldn't knock something until we've actually looked at it and tried it um spent a chunk of time then in secure mental health um actually in a learning support as a teacher um and a lot of the work there was regard i'd say chunk was empowerment working with advocacy because a lot of the guys that get sectioned think oh i've got no rights for this getting them to speak up saying what they want in life uh, various children's companies i worked and i worked within training worked in the management consultancy um different training management roles and then it was about just over three and a half years ago i shocked everyone and said you know what i'm ending my noticing and in january i'm launching my own training business instead i launched the business with one customer um it was very scary uh, that was a, an adult learning disability service and over the first eight nine months a lot of networking especially on linkedin people that you've worked with before whatever it was all getting big rocketing i was getting freelancers on board to support and covid came so the phone goes ringing because no one can go into a home um i found that because i run the business from real life that a lot of the increase was all around mental health and different conditions a lot of learning disability services were accessing support around self-harm about suicide um ideation ligatures and at the beginning of april so on april fool's day this year on to april fool two years behind original plan um the business went from me actually being self-employed to actually finally becoming that limited company so being around the block i've got a huge passion for learning disability for autism for mental health i'm really open about my own mental health i am diagnosed with autism so i do understand a lot that goes on in the world and yeah if we don't do positive risk taking then we may as well lock the door on people so, so you know for, for those who aren't aware what do we mean by positive risk taking what you know it's a, it's an easy enough sentence it's an easy of three words to say but what do we mean by positive risk taking it's <clears throat> we look at hazards we look at risks so how will that hazard affect what who will be affected by that hazard um and if i use an example um in a mental health service a young adult male young female <clears throat> they've decided they want to have a relationship <clears throat> and the initial powers that be oh my god we can't allow this blah 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 and i was what always quite outspoken i'm like well what does relationship mean to people you know and I, i'll ask everybody what does the word relationship mean to you i've got loads of different relationships you know i've got very personal ones i've got very professional ones and i it, it actually got thrown back to me and said oh why didn't you check then i went yeah i will actually and i sat with both of the the patients individually and we're saying, well, what does it mean to you if you were to have this, in quotes, relationship? What would you want from it? And one of the things they wanted was to be able to sit out in the grounds, just the two of them having a picnic. And I'm like, yeah, we can sort that. A member of staff will be in the grounds, keeping an eye on things. <clears throat> and it's these things about if we don't balance all the risk that, that could be there and don't think about what the positive outcome could be, because that could mean the world to somebody that they can sit and have a picnic. You know, we had an, another guy who wanted to go to the pub and have a beer because he's got a twin brother that's got not not got any disabilities and he knows his brother goes to the pub. So let's speak with the doctors. Let's say what they've asked for. Let the doctor review the medication. Let the doctor offer to us. What could we do? <clears throat> and he can go to the pub. He can't have a full pint of beer because of what it might do to the meds. But we can go to the bar. We can get him a pretty much 70 percent lemonade topped up with beer. And he's happy because he's got his pint and there's 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 so much to it it's it's managing what the potential risks are and how can we meet them in the most productive and positive way for somebody yeah and it's 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 about that 
you know, the, the risk that that person's taking, the 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 benefits and to their their well being, their overall health, their overall life outweighs the risk initially being taken, doesn't it? Mark, learning disabilities, I know you've told me umpteen stories in the past about what you used to get up to in your care home. Uh, positive risk taking, what's your experience? Do you know, I, I go back to kind of part when I was 17, 18, and the people we supported just weren't allowed to do anything. And I remember thinking, they just want to do things that we all want to do, you know, in everyday life. And I remember, you know, you'd have staff that came in and they'd have, you know, a sleeve of tattoos or they'd dyed their hair bright pink or blue. And they just wanted to do that. And it was like, oh, no, you can't do that. And a bit like what Mark was saying, you know, we've got a learning disability, you can't do that or you can't do that. And it was, why can't these people, you know, do what they want to do? You know, it's their life. And I think there's so much red tape around, you know, risk assessments and being so risk adverse that actually we've gone the other way in social care where actually we limit people's choices and chances in life. And I think for me, managing, and I think it helped working in learning disability services first before I went into elderly, because it kind of highlighted, you know, how much actually you have to go that step further in learning disabilities kind of get the green light to go ahead and do something. And then obviously when it's in elderly services, it's obviously a lot easier. But yeah, we would, you know, Mark spoke about the pub. We would go down the pub. We would be supporting residents that would want to drink. And it'd be about engaging in conversations with doctors, you know, the people around them, the professionals, the, you know, the person themselves, if they lacked capacity, their family members. And we would be, you know, I remember being 18 and we would be, you know, supporting people home that were staggering and falling into bushes, but no different than I would have been doing you know, myself on a Friday night, you know, if I wasn't working. So, yeah. And, you know, I think like Mark said, a lot of the time somebody says they want to do something, but actually it's not to the full degree that you and I would do it. You know, they might say they want to go to a concert and stand, you know, stand up. It was to me, you know, being at a concert stood up, it'd be right at the front in the front row, you know, being like pushed against that security gate. But for the person, you know, most of the time, it's actually they just want to be stood up the back, you know, just living their best life, listening to live music with a Diet Coke in their hand and, you know, singing along. And I think like Mark said, it's actually having that communication and sitting with the person and saying, actually, what do you want from this? What experience do you want? And then, you know, planning that out. But I think there is a lot of pushback, you know, from local authorities, from the CQC, who obviously regulate us. And the second something goes wrong, everybody's on your case about why you did it. I remember we had one home you know, the staff were roller skating around and, you know, somebody fell over and it was, well, why are you roller skating around your home? Well, I've got three kids and two of them roller skate around my house the whole time. It's no different, you know, you know, six-year-olds doing it than somebody with a learning disability, you know, you know, accidents happen, things happen, but actually the joy and the, you know, the memories that I would have brought to the person is better and that weighs, you know, the risk of somebody possibly falling over. I think you've um, hit the nail on the head there. There's there's too much fear of litigation nowadays, isn't there? There's too much fear of a, a blame being put upon somebody. If something goes wrong, why were they doing it in the first place? And we've sort of forgotten to understand that although someone lives with, say, 24-hour care or lives with care at home or with any form of social care intervention, they're entitled to live a life. And people are entitled to have an access to a life which benefits them personally. And I think it comes down to, in, in some regards, um, shared decision making and making sure that the person involved in receiving that care, their relatives are all involved in um, making those decisions. So, Mark, at How to See, um, what is it that you do to enable people and empower people to support positive risk taking? So one of the one of the it's actually been a really popular course. It, it starts off looking at risk assessments. It looks at different risk assessment matrices, and then we start discussing. Um, I use a random example, and I'll say I'm one of your residents. I'm a service user. <clears throat> I've woken up today, and I've told you that I want to go a walk around outside naked, and everyone goes shocked because I've said it to Matt. But that's what I'm saying today. Now, what can what can you do? And it's when you get somebody saying, oh, you can't because it's illegal. Well, actually, it's technically not illegal. It's only when people complain that it's offensive. Oh, OK. And then I'll say, I'm also, you can't tell because I'm old, but I'm also a ginger-haired person. 
so what's the weather like and even that people start giggling at first and then they start saying well we've got to get all this information for you and i had somebody on training the other week that they actually worked with a young person with a learning disability that said the same thing so it's about getting all the resources available to, to assist them with an informed choice now they got to where that young person could walk around outside with a really loose caftan on but stay naked underneath so as random as it could sound, and at first we'll think, oh, no, it's, well, actually, we, we've got to look at that. And then I went bringing into the equation of me being a gingerhead person, even though I'm a rare ginger, because I'm one of them rare ginger people that does tan. I don't just go beetroot red. Um, it, well, actually, we need to we need to talk to you about when you've been sunburned before. What did it feel like to be sunburned? Um, and it's it's looking about what resources can we get in to help somebody to make that choice make that decision I, I remember and I, I can't remember the year but it was when the first Pirates of the Caribbean film came out the very first one um working in learning disabilities and one of the young people I think he was 18 he'd just come onto our service he wanted to go and watch the film and I, if I remember right he got ADHD he'd got epilepsy he'd got a learning disability and everyone's like oh no 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 no, it'll be a nightmare I'm like but nobody's tried nobody sat with him and what do you he looked we didn't realize he loved pirates so that's a good activity straight away. Let's get art activities going. Let's look at parrots. He was fully aware of his, if you like in quotes, his behaviours that challenge people. So I would say, okay, so if we're in the cinema and you present me with that behaviour, what might happen? And ultimately he turned around and said, oh, the, the people in the cinema might phone the police. And I'm like, so would you want that? To no, I wouldn't. So again, that got thrown back. Well, maybe you can take him. I went, well, I will. I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, he stayed for the whole film. He didn't present any of his behaviours. Um, he did fall asleep for a large chunk of the film with his head on my shoulder and my sleeve was soaked in slobber, but I didn't mind. And then he woke up with about 20 minutes to go, got into the last 20 minutes. He's like, that's the best film I've ever seen. Thank you so much for bringing me today. And he's, when we walked out of that cinema, his shoulders were so high because he'd been allowed to, and I shouldn't even say the word allowed, because we shouldn't be allowing, yet he'd been facilitated to do that. And, you know, that was even back then, and, oh, these, these it really winds me up, they've got these conditions, well, everyone with the diagnosed condition is all completely different. And and the big thing, if we're working on learning disability, I, I don't know if it's only, I, I presume it's other people's views, is let's take the diss away from ability and just use the word ability. Because there's too, there's too much of an umbrella that goes over it. And, you know, we, we, we looked, I'm going back a long time for the cinema, but, you know, what one thing we could do is speak to the cinema and say, right, generally throughout the week, when is your really quietest time? Because <clears throat> I'm not going to go on a Saturday night when it's absolutely packed. So I, don't, I think it was a Wednesday afternoon or something. So let's try that one. Um, and... I did some work. I was in a training company, I think it was about 10 years ago, and one of the theatres in Wolverhampton wanted to do one of the first relaxed performances for people with autism and learning disability. So I went out and did some autism awareness with them. I went around the building saying, how oh, you change this, change that, so it's not environmentally overstimulating. Um, and they did, it was uh, Joe Pasquale was the lead actor and went to the dress rehearsal. They'd got lots of people in with LD and autism. I sat up on a balcony. I felt like one of them blokes off the Muppet show that used to sit on that balcony. Um, and I'm making notes. And one of the things he did, he got his gun, water gun, and said, oh, don't worry, kids, it's only bleach. So straight away, I'm writing down, don't say that, please. And they were one of the first theatres to run a successful one. And if we go back years, oh, we can't take them to a pantomime because there'll be loud noises. Well, let's assess the loud noises. Let's reduce the loud noises. Oh, there'll be too many flashing lights. Well, we can actually have more lights on in the theatre than it being in the dark. And I, I, I always have a, a, I'm a never say never person. So. Mm. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And we had um, Mike Adams on from Purple um, recently and uh, Kira Lawrence from Mencap. And we had these conversations about making things more disability aware, more disability friendly. And the, the, the small adaptions we can make to 
make people's lives better and more accessible to to everyday things. I will say about the cinema, I would rather go and see a film full of people who have um, learning disabilities than the general public at this moment in time, because the last film I went to see was full of teenagers screaming, shouting, swearing, throwing popcorn and making a right nuisance. And I thought to myself, this is just horrendous. So anyone out there who's afraid they may cause a disturbance because of their disabilities in a, in a cinema, please don't feel that bad because we have children and they're even worse a lot of the time. And I know I'm probably going to regret saying that, but you know, that's how I feel. There's, there's not as much social etiquette nowadays when it comes to things like that. But it is about living life as normal as we possibly can do. And it's about making sure we can empower people to make those decisions and to have that lived experience that we are all entitled to. So, Mark, what are your, uh, sorry, um, Mark Howe, what are your top tips for providers to um, make sure that they're thinking about the most accessible ways for people to access uh, their communities, to make those positive risk choices? Um, what, what are your top tips for providers? I think, first of all, it, should, it is your person-centred care. It's viewing that person as the expert in their care. If we have to go out a little bit, speaking to family, friends, etc., let's think about them being the expert i think it's about getting them the materials in a level that they can actually understand um getting if we've got certain members of staff that have got more knowledge or experience let's draw on them let's not think oh that person's got a key worker they're the only ones that can work on that we, we could we could get more people involved it's getting that relationship and and it, it's saying it's saying as a team you know what what can we do if we risk assess this how can we make sure that we can get this to happen for, to give that person a good quality of life um there could be something that you know when i was talking about relationship stuff as soon as that come out we had other patients wanting it and chatting to some of them it was a definite no-no because -no, some of the things they were saying they wanted from a relationship was quite off the scale so again that's your initial risk assessment you're getting the information but I, I do think especially if we talk learning disability we've got to find the communication tool that actually meets their need so, so you know as an example for me i i can actually do makaton sign language so if that's their preferred tool if i'm in your network as in where we're working is i know let's give mark how senior ring because he could probably come over and he could help with this with that um and i think it is that it's balancing the risk it's also about whether we need to um be really honest that you know actually you want to do this to this level when we've looked at how it could all work we can only go to two levels below because this is what the risk would be um, and i think transparency as well yeah i think you know I agree with all of those things. And I think for me, it's one thing I used to say to my staff teams, and I, I still would now if anybody wanted you know, to take a, take a risk is, you need to get the risk assessment for five minutes. I think we are so, let's write a risk assessment and see what the risks are. And I think then you automatically focus on the risk as opposed to actually what you want to achieve. And one thing that I used to do in the, in the learning disability services, and obviously the majority of them are small, is I would go and sit with each each person we were supporting and I would ask them for three things that they wanted to achieve in that year. You know, whether that was they wanted to do a bit of colouring, they wanted to go to a concert, whatever the three things they were. And I would say to the staff team, these are the three things they want to do. Now we have a duty of care to make those three things happen. And it might be actually you only got one of them done because by the time you've done travel training the bits and pieces, but we would aspire to achieve all three things bit involving families and one thing I would always do is explain to families when I took over managing the service that actually I'm very different as a manager you know yes we'll have risk assessments in place but actually they'll come after everything else after those conversations and actually you know if your son or daughter doesn't want to go outside for a snowball fight then the snow will come inside the building and we can do a risk assessment for that afterwards because actually you know everybody loves the snowball fights the majority of people love a snowball fight but just because somebody can't get outside doesn't mean you can't bring it to them. And I remember one service in the summer 
we took a hose pipe into the lounge to have a water fight because they didn't want to go outside because of the risk of being worried that they would burn. Why not have a water fight inside? Because it covered all the plugs, we made it all say, you know, it wasn't like we had a massive full on hose, but we made the hose trickle. So nothing was going to get ruined or damaged or anything. But actually, you know, for that person, you could just see how lit up they were that they were being involved in that water fight. I used to do, um, from a care worker perspective, I used to do, I wasn't to the activity coordinator because in them days we didn't have an activity coordinator, but I used to love doing craft activities and stuff. And we had a young lady who, she was quite severely limb disabled. She's physically disabled. She was non-verbal. Um, she was totally, absolutely beautiful. And I was doing, I, we, we were doing some cutting card, making shapes, whatever. And I wanted her to be involved and I didn't want to risk her having the scissors the same as the lads. So can you remember the call pinking shears, them scissors that cut zigzag shapes? <clears throat> so I remember sitting there and I've got some orange card and the stuff like, are you, her name began with a D. Are you, is, she, is she allowed to? I'm like, well, we've never, ever tried. I said, and she's watching, she's smiling, she wants to take part. I said, so I'll do hand on hand. Um, so we were doing the excitement in her face because she was doing the same activity. And then she managed to cut a shape out of her own and then she suddenly showed new communication because she was pointing to me and she made me take this shape out of her hand into my hand. And I've still got that somewhere. I've kept it because she'd not been empowered to do it. And yes, normal scissors might have, we've never tried, let's try something a bit safer. And suddenly a shape's made no sense. You know what I mean? They were just cut out things. She was so happy and excited. And, and people would say, oh, <clears throat> scissors are dangerous. Well, they can be. But they, they, she she took part, and you know, I I coming from like a teaching perspective, a right before the care, doing something like that means more to me than being in a secondary school and children getting the top grades at GCSE. Um, I had a guy come from high secure that wanted to read, and he was in his fifties. Uh, probably not risk management because I could do it anyway, and it took six months for him to learn the alphabet because he always said the letter H was the rugby post. And I could have easily ticked off. I thought, yeah, it's done. But I waited. And the day that, he'd, you know, and it took six months. And the day he went from A to Z perfectly, a huge certificate, a big celebration. And he walked out and he went, thank you so much for teaching me to read. So someone would have said, oh, reading means you've got to read books, whatever. Well, no, not always. So I think it, it's about, it, it. we have to look at, all the relevant resources to assist someone to achieve what they want to achieve. Let's say, Mark, you mentioned about roller skating around a home. There's a big thing in there in care that we say to anybody, no matter what aspect of care support, domiciliary, whatever, but people work in their home, they don't live in your workplace. And I think that's the concept. I think sometimes regulators forget that they'll be very jumped down, oh, why are we doing, why are we doing that? Well, because it's their home. I remember when we the first year of the pandemic when I saw stuff going around social media that a regulator was saying that homes shouldn't have any Christmas decorations or Christmas trees up. And I am reading it thinking, God, if I was still doing that, I'd be in so much trouble because I'd go against that rule straight away. Because I know the guys I worked with learning disability adored Christmas, adored putting that stuff up. I actually got in touch with my local council and asked them to rescind that guidance um, and went on TV talking about it because it was just an absolute joke. Oh, no, you can't have your Christmas tree because of COVID. Mm, really? Where's the risk on that Christmas tree compared to all of the times of the year? What an absolute sort of sense of trying to protect people by destroying their little joys in life. And that's where it comes to, we, we go to the nth degree too much of the time. You know, we don't sit there and go, how will this affect them physiologically? How will this affect them psychologically? How will this affect their social welfare? How will, affect, how will this affect them holistically? We don't look at that. All we want to do is make sure we're going to go, oh, let's tick a box. Yes, we're doing everything we can. They can't be at risk because we're going to take it away. We're not looking at how we can still give it them whilst mitigating as many of the risks possible in that situation. The Christmas tree thing really wound me up. Sorry, Mark, I put it in. I saw you on mute. No, no I, remember, I just remember, I remember seeing it on a post on LinkedIn. And 
I did put a comment. I remember put, I don't comment a lot on social media because otherwise my phone keeps pinging all day with everyone else's comments. But I remember putting on, gosh, the guys I worked with learning disability, I'd have hated the thought of even saying, we can't put them up because that would have just given escalation in behaviours. And if it was that it was proven that because of COVID it was so dangerous, why aren't we putting them somewhere where there's a, a, a barrier then between? You know, the, 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 this is where we are risk averse and, oh, let's stop everything. You know, maybe we put decorations on the highest ceiling that people can't touch. And and it, it, it it's always battered me because I, I know I know it in my own life, whether it be within mental health, within the, the autism or whatever. I know where I face restrictions, but I've got decent enough cognitive ability to adapt to do it. So we need to be the adapters. We need to be those emotional intelligence and resilience support people. Because then I know before we went live, we were talking about mental health, because the more we restrict people, the more the mental health gets severely affected. You know, we had we had a guy that um, he sat in his meeting and said he wanted uh, Superman wallpaper. And somebody said he's 34. And I went, so what? And they were like, what? I said, that's what he wants. But we we did look at um, this aspect because if he'd have had all four walls with the wallpaper he wanted, there was more chance of him having more seizures because of how busy the wallpaper was. So I remember sitting with him and saying, look, this is the one you want. How about if we do that wall with Superman and then we do these other walls another colour? Because our risk management, risk averse is let's not allow any of it. Let, let's just dictate. But then when we do our, I know we've got think risk assessment. Well, actually, we can reduce it. It can still achieve it. And I remember sitting in there, someone said, it's babyish. And I went, I've got a teddy named Teddy Howe, a grey teddy. And I've got an orange teddy named Yogi Bear that I had from when I was born. And they sit in a bedroom window. No one can tell me that I'm babyish because I keep on to something from when I was born. And then it, it's about, I think when we look at positive risk management, it's about the reasonable adjustments that we, we explore. And, I, you know, I think that's a big thing for me. There's also something about societal norms as well, though, because it really irks me when people go, oh, that's childish or that's infantile because... I play Pokemon. I have superhero comics. You know, I still think uh, do things that people would consider childish, but I enjoy them. No one looks down on me upon it. In fact, it, it, within the LGBT community, which I'm a part of, it's a quirk. You know, it's a bit of a kink. It's like, oh, they're a nerd. They're a geek. How cool is that? You know, someone with a learning disability or somebody who isn't part of that community, and all of a sudden it's a, it's a negative, it's looked down upon, it's frowned upon, it's, you know, it's patronised. And that comes from supporting people without understanding them holistically and not making what's important to them important to us. And that's what passion and care is about, isn't it? It's looking at what's important to people and making it equally as important to us. Because then we can go this person needs this to live a fulfilled life. So we're going to make that happen. And it's about doing it in the, in the best way possible. Sorry, Mark, uh, Mark, my colleague, Mark, I, you, you're muted uh, again. Yeah, no, thank you. I think two things kind of when you were talking about, you know, kind of Pokemon and things, I think some of the problem from definitely staff that I've managed, it's their perception of how they're going to be perceived when they're out and about in the community, whether that's with somebody elderly or somebody with a learning disability. And actually if that's, Kind of your mindset then you're on the wrong job because actually you should go out there and not giving two flying f's that you know they're screaming in the middle of the cinema because actually why not just you know scream with them and make it look like it's normal because that's the kind of thing i would have done and i think when we were talking about you know risk taking i think some of it goes to the design of the services and i know from my days of you know elderly services is the amount of elderly people that have bedroom doors that lead onto a lovely garden but it's blocked with a bloody flower pot so they can't get outside and it just infuriates me and i just kind of think when they're designing these homes why not have you know a risk assessment from the start that looks at that landscape so that people can go in and out of their bedrooms freely this the site's secure they're not going to go anywhere you know but just let people wonder you know and then if they have falls and actually look at why they're having the falls and what caused that fall and is it you know their health or is it that they tripped or slipped or you know is it medication or whatever it is but 
yeah, frustratingly, so many homes have those doors that just open up and hit that trough or whatever it is to stop them. So what can we do risk assessment wise? What can we do when we're looking at the services we're providing and the people we're supporting? What could a provider who's maybe too afraid to go, actually, yes, you can just go to the shops on your own or I don't mind if you come back with a tattoo. What are the sort of things we could be looking at risk assessment wise to promote this then? It's mental capacity. I think we, we've got to include the mental capacity, haven't we, to, to its entirety. And I think it's also about individual assessments. So we to give an example, we had a young guy who couldn't, he, he only ever called money. He called it paper pounds or metal pennies. That's his understanding of money, but he wanted to go shopping. And it would be so easy to say, oh, we do, he can't do money, um, whatever. And so it's like, well, why don't we take him to the shop and see how he acts in the shop first? You know, rather than just poo-poo something, let's actually go to the shop. Let's see what he's like in the shop. And he could see the things he liked. And then when it got to money, because he'd never been allowed to carry his own money, he'd, 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 he'd got some money and he'd shove it into your hand because no one had allowed him before. So we said, let's try something. Let's today, right, I won't say his name, but you give that lady your paper pound, which is a £10 note. I said, and when, when she's giving and she gives you your, your metal pennies back, pass them to me and I'll add them up for you and see the retail's right for you because he couldn't add up. And we can adapt these activities to the maximum for them. You know, and he come back and he had to tell, I've been shopping today and I paid for my own shopping, I did. And you did, because that was to your maximum, and it was absolutely brilliant, you know. And and it's, you know, yes, we've got risk assessments. We've got risk assessments, you, and again for that one, we would have spoken to the shop and said, look, have you generally got a quietest time? You know, I know, I know from my own perspective, before we started with COVID, Christmas shopping in supermarkets for me is an absolute nightmare because it, they're just packed with people. And I have my social anxiety with too many people. So I remember speaking to the the kiosk and said, you because I was new to the area, and I'm like, when is usually your quietest time over the Christmas shopping? So that then I could I could choose to go at that time for me. So we we could, for this as, as a shopping that we support it. But it's 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 about these reasonable adjustments and it's it's adaptation. It's, you know, just be when we say that someone wants to go to the shop, or what do you want to go to the shop for? What do you want, you know, it, what would you like to buy? Or is it because you want to go and meet some people or do you want to talk to people? What's the reason for you to go to the shop? OK, so let's look at how we can support you to do this. So I might need to, first of all, get some money in the home and let's have a little bit of a test on what this money means to you. Because on paper, oh, they can't. I had a guy who um, on paper he'd got, I think it was a severe learning disability, got autism, is non-verbal. Oh, we can't count. And I remember saying, right, okay, has anyone ever tried different ways with him? And he came from Blackpool. So I printed out pictures of trams, of the tower, of donkeys. His name began with a P. And I just randomly said, right, P, please fetch me four towers. And he could count from zero to ten, but it was finding the tool that worked for him to do that. And when I went to senior team and I went, he can count from zero to 10. No, 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 he can't. I said, he can. I said, but we have to use images that he'll understand. And yes, going to the shop, but it isn't just what do you want to go to the shop for? What What's the meaning for you to go there? And, and the guy I mentioned at the beginning of this bit, he'd never been allowed to actually carry his own money. And I'm like, that's bonkers. That's ridiculous. It's his money. You know, maybe we need to, if, if he's losing money, we'll get some something that carries the money that's locked and we keep the key. He can still carry his own money. So I get on my soapbox, to be honest, about the, the I really get wound up when they've got well, they've got lens pills they can't do. And I'm like, well, we'll help them to do. Yeah. You know, I was. I remember being at a, sorry, I remember being at a conference and it was a lady talking about dementia. And I've worked in nursing side as well. And the guy said, I want to climb a mountain. And he's from like, oh, my God, it's so dangerous. And she says, well, 
let's find the smallest mountain we can. It's got the weird mountain in it. And he will have climbed a mountain. Yeah. Do we think things have changed since the pandemic? Because, I mean, I remember far back is 2013, 2014, we were talking about positive risk taking and making sure that people were empowered to make the decisions they want to in a safe capacity. And when the pandemic came, it was even to the point where people with capacity were stopped from going outside, they were stopped from going shopping, they were stopped from seeing loved ones. And I feel like we've taken like a decade step back when it comes to positive risk taking. So, and this is just for, for everyone here tonight. Do we think that the pandemic's had a, a, um, a time machine effect on social care? Do we think we've gone back in time a bit in our approach to how we deliver care? Mark, do you want to go first? Yeah, okay. I think to a degree it has because we've had all these regulations and the ones that used to get released at half past four on a Friday, ready to be rolling on a Monday. Um, I remember when we had the first briefing with Boris about the lockdown, and I remember vividly getting so baffled when he said, you can go outside anywhere you live and exercise once a day. I've got two Jack Russells and I take them out three times a day. Not big long walks, little dogs. I sat there really baffled thinking, how can I explain to two dogs we can only go out once? And then I'm going over thinking that, well, when I go out at eight in the morning, I'm going down that way. When I go at six at night, I'll go that way. And when I pop out at nine at night, I'll go that way. And then I'll wear different clothes. So people will think, you know, well, what's going on? And then I sat thinking, you're really overthinking all this. And I'm thinking, the people I've worked with before, it's just it we 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 do we did have to be really really careful we, it was something unknown to us <clears throat> but it was like a blanket was placed over everybody and then they updated it didn't they that somebody perhaps learned disability autism can be taken to a quieter area in a vehicle well i believe that services should have been allowed to make that judgment call and and, and I, I think we've we have learned a lot in the last two years but I do think that it might have, I don't want to sound too political, it might have allowed certain services to jump themselves a bit back at being service-led rather than person-led. Yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. I think you've got obviously two types. Of, I think the elderly services, I think a lot of providers took those residents' voice and decisions and made it for them. And I think talking about kind of a learning disability, Expect, is that they lost so many skills that they would have had over the last two years that actually it's reverted them back that they've got to learn all those skills again but i think one thing i know from speaking to staff you know in the home that i was managing at the time and other homes is that actually it highlighted and made them aware of how limited it is within a care home and actually i think only being able to go out once a day you were able to have those conversations with your staff teams and say this is during, you know, it's only been a month and look at, you know, how it's already. This is actually how somebody lives their whole life, 365 days of a year. And actually, when we get out the other side, this is why they should be going out, you know, as many times of the day as they want. And actually, we should be pushing back on commissioners to make sure that, you know, people have the support that they need. I think going back to the conversation we had um, regarding how to take positive risks, I think from my experience, the biggest thing for me and I know you touched on it, Mark, was around the transparency and the open communication. So right from the start, so with the relatives saying, you know, this is what your son, daughter, mum, dad wants to achieve. This is what we're doing about it. The social worker, even if they weren't involved, but just dropping an email saying, just to let you know, Mrs. Mr. Whoever wants to do this, this is what we're doing about it, X, Y, Z. And then making sure that people have that communication throughout the whole process, just to let you know we've done this or this or and really playing on the positives when things went right, but also being honest when things didn't quite go to plan and how you were going to resolve that. But I think from staff, is communicating with staff about, you know, what actually are the risks. There's no point in putting somebody in a situation that puts them in a vulnerable position or in an awkward position, because then obviously everything backfires because they get their backs up, they're nervous or they're embarrassed and being honest, but also asking if they need training or shadowing or something, because yeah. actually if the staff feel confident, it's more likely to be a success for the person that you're supporting and it's more likely to happen and continue happening. I, I um, the, the risk assessment and positive risk management in health and social care course, 
I delivered it again. It was to um, domiciliary, a domiciliary customer last month, I think. And I know I've, I've got a wacky delivery style and I've got different ways that I can get this training across. Yes, I shocked them. It was on Zoom and I said, right, I want to go walk around naked, risk assess me. And they're like, I beg your pardon. And I'm like, that's what I want to do. Um, and I'm like joking. I'm like, and I'm, trust me, it's not a pretty sight. Um, and got it going. And one of the, I can't remember that it wasn't like, she wasn't a manager. I think she was a, a senior care coordinator, something like that. She actually emailed the training manager and I put a quote of it on LinkedIn because she actually put how she'd actually enjoyed training on risk assessment. And it's made her think how we can actually adapt, how we do risk assessments. Legally, we've got to, you know, we've got to justify but it's the, it's it. I always think it's the bigger picture, and it is. You know, we you know we we. I rem, I'll, I'll never forget when I first started in a mental health service that we had a, a care review meeting and the patient come in, and it was around an oval table, and the patient was sat right at this end, and I'm thinking this is like a firing squad. So I said, "Here, you move along. I'll sit there." And everyone glared at me, and I went there, and he just went, "Oh, thanks ever so much." And then everyone had the notes out, the, the meeting minutes. And I'm thinking, I've just assessed his literacy, he can't read. And I'm like, you're not you're not helping him to achieve if you're not meeting his, his actual need. Um, and this is what this is about. It, it, it is about the transparency. And we might get off a relative, oh, I don't think I want them to do that. But actually, it's what they've said they want to do. So we, we are looking at the mental capacity. We are looking at positive risk management we are looking at reasonable adjustments and you know I, I'm, I'm heavily into athletics so if someone with learned disability watch athletics and said oh i want to run as fast as that man they might not ever run as fast as usain bolt but we can tweak it and we can look at the local athletic stadium we can set something up we can have someone at the start we can have someone with a stopwatch we can have the big celebrations and I'm, I am a big believer in let's not say no until we have actually given this a go. It's, you know, taking someone with epilepsy swimming, well, let, let's see why we, they might have a seizure. Well, there's the key word, they might. They also might not. I was having this conversation earlier on today, actually, and it was around how, uh, it was actually around dementia and how families who are unpaid carers don't get the support until it's too late, till we're at crisis point. And I think when it comes to especially learning disabilities and we talk about shared decision making and positive risk taking, I think there's also an element here that people who are family carers haven't always been given the support they need to, to empower and enable in these situations. And as providers, as, as, as care providers, as, as care homes, as, as care companies, we can come off a little bit, I know, more than you in these situations, which can cause those sort of abrasive relationships, which we don't want. But what we want to be able to do is go to relatives and, and go to unpaid carers. Actually, these are possibilities. And, you know, we don't begrudge you for not knowing it because the system and the infrastructure is not there to support you in this. But as a provider, we're going to show you the, the opportunities that are available and how we can make that possible. And it's got to really be that holistic work, and hasn't it? It's got to be a 360 approach to get everybody on board. Otherwise, it does become a bit of, no, you can't. Yes, we can, because we know more than you. And that's not what we want either in social care. Have you ever experienced anything like that, um, Mark, when you were running an LD home, Mark Tops? I think for me, it was, I was always conscious about how the family felt. So obviously, I've got, people in my family that have got disabilities. So I can see it from both sides, which I think gives me a kind of a unique angle. And I always used to say to staff, you have to remember, you know, we're looking after their son, their daughter, and actually they are very, you know, wrapped in cotton wool and they are mollycoddled, but actually that's the reason why, because actually they're so worried that something might happen to them because they've already got a disability. They kind of almost worry that something additional might happen, which then does hinder. So I think, it goes back to that communication with the family saying, look, we understand your concerns. What are your concerns? How can we help to alleviate them? But equally, this is what your son, your daughter wants to do. And we're going to do everything we can to make it happen. And we want you to be involved, but don't hinder it. You know, we want you to be positive. 
And I know, Mike, you've spoken about sexual relationships and the amount of people that I've supported, you know, to be in a sexual relationship. And the parents are adamant, actually, no, they shouldn't be doing it. Well, you can't go into the room with your son or daughter and be really negative from the outset about it because then it just evokes that whole, oh, mum and dad don't want me to, and oh, but I want to, but they don't want me to. You know, you've got to be positive. You know, it's a bit like with my kids, you know, they want to do something. I might not want them to do something, but actually I'm going to let them make their own mistake. I'm going to let them, you know, I can tell them exactly what's going to happen. You know, if you jump down every single one of those steps, sooner or later, you're going to slip and you're going to fall and go down on your bottom. But I'm going to watch them and do it. And actually, when they get to the bottom, I'll make sure that I can say, look, actually, I told you that's what's going to happen. And that's what we need to do with people. You know, as long as there's the risk assessments there, and I hate that bloody word risk assessment, I'd much rather that was gone from the regulations. I think it causes so many problems for people that use care services. But as long as that risk assessment is in place and you've done everything you can to mitigate that risk, there's not much more you can do. We had, um, and it's obviously you know, younger adults with learning disability when puberty probably starts a bit later than a non learning disability. And one lad in particular, he he had to be taught about private time because he would just start doing whatever whenever that need arose. And you know, in a lounge for the people watching Emmerdale, it isn't really appropriate to start doing that. And you know, some and, and I was this is 20 years ago, so some and generationally, there were some older males. Oh, it's wrong, this shouldn't be. And I was like, You're telling me when you started puberty, you didn't touch yours, and that's different. I'm like, It's not different at all, it's just about teaching someone. So, we used to say to him, Look, when you get that age, just pop to your bedroom, just lock your door, and if your door's locked, we know, you know, and then here's some stuff you know this is how you can clean yourself up when you're finished and i would quite just say you know everyone does it you know it's up to you it's fine and that mark i'm like but it's it, it, just because they've got whatever condition they've still got the same needs and urges as people without we just might have to and i'm with you mark on that with risk assessment yeah we will have that in our mind but actually let's just teach somebody they just need a few lessons on doing what they enjoy doing in the most appropriate way that won't it offend other people and and you know there's there's loads when we talk about external support and unpaid carers etc um it's not learning disability or dementia based but i know that i finally got the autism diagnosed on the 30th september 2020 and to this day since all that information's gone to my gp nobody's been in touch with me so I'm lucky I understand the condition inside out. I could give my family information on it. But I look at that and think there's no support for that. There's, there isn't. You know, and I had a phone GP appointment March last year. And the GP says, oh, you're very forthright. You're very abrupt with your answers. And I went, have you looked at what I got diagnosed with in September? And I had to go, oh. And I'm thinking, you've not even read me notes before you've rung me. And, and I think some of it will be. The, the the actual external support and i think it does mark you mentioned it it does highlight it, a need for for the training that that staff can then be trained in it um not just the risk side but do they actually understand the condition that someone's diagnosed with yeah and i think a lot of it goes back to the regulator as well though as well doesn't it because I mean, Mark and I both know what it's like to apply to become uh, part of our regulatory team and how much, you know, it it's really difficult to get in there unless you've not got a social care background. If you've not got a social care background, you've got more of a, a straight sort of path into becoming one of our uh, regulatory inspectors. And that's probably because they don't know as much as people who work in the sector. But I do know from talking to inspectors within the, the Care Quality Commission that John's campaign, for example, we would say that relatives would come and they would assist with washing, they'd assist with dressing, they helped their loved ones eat, they did medication. And the first thing a CQC inspector said to me was, is it because you're short staffed? Not seeing the holistic sort of picture and approach to family orientated, person led, person centered care. You know, so there's a there's a seismic shift required, not just within the actual provider sector, it's within the regulator as well, and within the whole sort of public image of social care. We're coming towards the end of the show now, and I'm just thinking for anybody who is either living in care, 
anybody who is related to someone who's drawing on services, what would be your message to them, Mark, post-pandemic? And I'm saying post-pandemic because Morrisons have taken away the, the clear plastic dividers now in between their self-checkout tills. So as far as I'm aware, the pandemic's over, according to Morrisons. So, you know, we're in this post-pandemic world now, uh, Mark How What's your message to those who are receiving care, living in care related to about asking for people to go, please listen to me as a person. What would be your, your message to them? Keep banging on that door until somebody opens it. Um, I would say, let's look at what staff team we've got. Let's use, I don't want to say the best tools in the box, but some staff are better at certain tasks than others. Let's use the best staff to achieve the best results. Um, you know, I think it's been it's just been open, being transparent, being honest. You know, if somebody says, "Oh, I want to fly an airplane," I'd never be able. I don't think I'd ever learn how to fly an airplane. So let's be honest. Say, "Well, we might not be able to fly one, but we might we could perhaps arrange a, some form of flight for you." Um, or flight simulator. Do they have yeah. they have them big things that you can sit in, don't you? That make yeah. you feel like. I mean, I wouldn't fly a plane. You winding me up. I'm petrified of getting in a plane. I wouldn't even dream of flying one. But there's things out there that replicates and simulates it that everybody would use, you know. If I wanted to feel what it was like to fly a plane, I'd go in a flight simulator. Yeah. You know, if I wanted to skydive and didn't want to risk my life, I'd go in one of them air tunnel things that float you around and stuff. So there's so much out there, isn't there, that can replicate those emotions and those those sentiments. I completely agree with you there, Mark. I, I would say briefly on that is whatever the want is so whatever that word or words that somebody wants to do is let's get the best person who can communicate with that person to actually find out what it means to them you know i use the quote of relationships and the relationship basically meant let's have a picnic outside and say nice things to each other but straight all oh, relationship is like well actually you know we need to get into their world and and this is it when i do autism training that one of the sayings i always say is you've got to get into their world and not expect them to naturally get into yours. And I think that's the key thing there. You know, if somebody wants to go shopping, well, what does shopping mean to them? You know, yeah. I loved the first lockdown when Tesco was nowhere near. People had to queue up a trolley in between each other because it meant no one was stood near me. It was lovely weather. And I was watching someone and thinking, you're, you're not exactly a trolley apart there. You're a bit close, you know, but we all had to learn and understand that. And, We've all got our own cognitive ability. And I think sometimes we make a, a prejudicial review that, oh, they've got dementia or, oh, they've got a learning disability. We need to do all this for them now. No, we don't. We need to empower rather than disempower. Exactly. I had a lad, exactly. it used to take a lad half an hour. We had a lad and it used to take half an hour to tie his shoelaces. Right. It would be easy for us to do it, but we'll change the daily routine and we'll add an extra 45 minutes so that he can still do his own shoelaces yeah no that makes sense it makes sense that um my mark as i will call you so that you know we don't get confused have you got anything to add before we um come to the end of the show i think for me and I, i've already said it but for anybody watching the kind of things is yeah we have to do risk assessments from a legal point of view but actually think if that was your son your daughter your mum your dad or even you that was using care services people don't want to do you know these crate they don't want to you know jump out of a plane most of the time they want to do things that you and i do day to day and take for granted like they want to go to the cinema they want to go to a concert or they want to go to a monster truck show or whatever it is you know they're not massive things they're things that can easily be arranged and you just actually have to think outside of the box with a can-do attitude and yeah and then do the risk assessment after to make sure that you know you haven't been risk adverse yeah i think mine would be around the care planning side of things and what do you actually need to put in their care notes you know and you've got to imagine that these care notes are something that they can read as much as they want to because they are their notes it is their care plan and would you really want to put down in somebody's care plan that they've been able to um pleasure themselves sexually or they've had intimate times with somebody else is that necessary to go in those care plans and should the notes that we actually be putting in be more stripped back and care focused then 
invasive in the in the way that they are. There's a lot that we need to be asking ourselves about the model of care moving forwards and how we approach it in a holistic person-centered way where it isn't a clinical about them scenario, it's a with them scenario. You know, I would suggest in learning disability environments especially that care notes and care plans should actually become more of a daily diary for people who are actually living in care and ask them to fill the notes in the majority of the time. This is what I've done today. This is what they've helped me achieve. These are the outcomes that I've wanted to get to. And this is what I've been able to do through the support of the people that I'm working with and living with. And I think those care notes would read much better than somebody jamming them all in last minute or sat on a non-person-centered digital device throwing them in. So there's a lot that needs to be taken in moving forwards on this. And I think it's a conversation that we'll be continuing to have for the next decade or so until we actually find something of a, of a decent um, uh, model. Um, Mark, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I know it's been a real insight for myself um, and, and for probably other Mark as well. And um, we hope you've enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Good. Mm. So next week, Mark, am I, am I putting you on the top uh, the spot again? Seeing as you've been away for the last few weeks, what have we got on next week? No, I prepped myself. I knew the question was coming. So <laughs> next week, as long as you know the spreadsheet in front of me is all right, we've got aiming for outstanding with Isaac Theophilus. So yeah, if that's the right week, I am really looking forward to that conversation. <laughs> no, it, honestly, it's going to be a really great uh, conversation. Isaac is. Um, one of the leading voices in care consultancies in really achieving that outstanding model of, of social care. So um, published author, renowned care consultant of the social care sector, really looking forward to next week's conversation. Uh, so until then, have a fabulous short week, seeing as it's been a, a four-day bank holiday, um, and we will see you next Tuesday. So take care and good night. See you later.